country in 15 or 20 years time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. I've just been rereading Enoch Powell, The Rivers of Blood speech. His prophecy was absolutely right in one sense. What's happened is that a substantial section of the chads that you wrote about have become black. Politically, we think of Black Lives Matter as, or we talk about it as though it's an inheritor of the Martin Luther King tradition. It isn't. They want, they're being used essentially as a front for people who want to overthrow things as they are. For me, I'm sorry, it's really emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed, children being killed every day with Putin's missiles. The police bill is the biggest threat to gypsy, roma and traveller communities in my lifetime. It has direct parallels in history. In 1936, the Nazis passed a similar decree. This is the beginning of that thin end of the wedge of persecution, and we're resisting it with everything we've got. Hello to everybody from Redline TV, and today we're talking about race. Now, it seems to me that we've spent a lot, a lot of time in the last few years thinking that we're talking about race when actually we haven't been talking about race. I mean, what is race? When did racist, racist characteristics, when were they actually defined? Who decided who was in different races? Who decided what races were like? Those are the kind of questions we're going to be asking, along with why did it happen and who benefits from this now before i start i have to say that i um i i would i just read today um an article from the independent which was about the way that non-white refugees from ukraine when they are fleeing the border are actually basically being put into european prisons White ones are being let out and being given homes and being given lots of support. And what this says to me is that at the core of the European project, whatever the liberal narrative that goes on, there is racism and that racism is actually essential to everything uh, that European modern culture is actually about. Now, to start with, we're going to be talking to Dr. Toyin Agbeitu, who's a lecturer in social and political anthropology. Uh, Dr. Agbeitu. Good evening, Jackie. Nice oh, to great to see you. Um, so, you know what we're going to be talking about today, race, or what people think of as race. So I wonder if I could start off by asking you, how was this thing that we called race constructed? Well, that's, that's a big one. It uh, is, yeah. Because it has, it has many phases in history. So, I mean, if we go right way to the beginning, when we recognize that humanity started in the Pangaea, I mean, you know, and then, then moved to Kemet when the the, the continent split, there were such things as non-racial civilization societies. People lived together and they recognized the different clans or different communities, whatever the term we use. <clears throat> but this idea of race being defined by our, our pigmentation just, just didn't exist. Um, the, the version of race that we know now probably started first in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, kind of like in medieval England, if you're thinking about the 14th century. Um, we, we often, hear it in context of enslavement because that's a, a later reinvention of race but it actually started in England when you started seeing people like who were Irish or the early incarnations of Islamophobia or people who were Jewish being marked out as being something less than human and so this whole idea that they are normal human beings and then there's these kind of like deviants kind of like who are you know with the Irish it was like you know they look like us but we can't kind of like procreate with them because they contaminate the bloodline uh, all these kind of narratives came of that, and then, of course, with the Moors. But that's a part of the, the genealogy of racialization that we're not very familiar with, the, the one that took place in, in the Middle Ages in England. The one that's more common and more prevalent is the one that started with African enslavement. And this is when we started moving into the 16th, 17th century, and Carl Linnaeus, 
and during the Enlightenment era, we started hearing things about um, uh, there being races. This is this whole idea of cultural evolutionism. So people accepted the idea of evolutionism. So Darwinism was kind of like proved in, to, to a degree and people accepted that. But this whole idea that everyone came from a single source was being very, very much contested. So we had this whole idea about perfectionism, had this whole idea about polygenesis. Uh, and all these were ideas saying that actually, you know, there's one race that's supreme, which is the race that's racialized as white. I don't use racializing language, by the way. So I don't talk black people, brown people, white people, yellow people, red people. I mean, the racializing project even invented green people for Martians. I mean, it really was a bit nonsensical. There were colors placed on every single group of people, but that's the version that we have inherited. And because it was used so compellingly to justify the enslavement of African people and the colonization of other people. I talk about African people going pan Africanist by the in the Americas. I'll be talking about the extermination of the indigenous people because it was used in other territories around the world. Um, then what happened is that we still live with this legacy. So you may see me on the screen and, you know, if I say to you, what is my ethnic background? You'd probably be a bit confused. Ethnic, what's he talking about? If I said, what's my race? So you'll say, you're black man. And then you'll see that actually looking at my skin, I'm actually not a black man, I'm a brown man. And so we recognize that there's something wrong there, but we, we have a simple construction of what black is. And we have a simple constru symbolic construction of what whiteness is. And we slot people these into categories and it's so normalized. And unfortunately the discipline I'm a part of anthropology is, 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 is responsible for the pseudoscience that made that kind of reality that we struggle to, to, to fight against it. And what I liked about what you spoke about earlier when you talked about the Ukraine situation, and this is a, a complex issue, is what people don't realize that people can actually be assigned into different races. So I spoke about how the Irish community in, in, in the Middle Ages were actually seen as black. They were seen as not white. But when the Irish community, for example, moved to the Americas and started joining in the oppression of African-Americans, then they actually were able to join Team Whitey and then they became white. Now, of course, I'm not saying Irish people who are in the UK don't face colonization, but I'm just trying to explain that the constructions of who's black and white is always shifted because it is a social construct. We hear the term, but it literally is that permeable, that it's, it, 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 you know, it, it, it bends to political expediency. Okay, so um, accepting that, of course, because we all know that actually there is just one group of people, humanity, right. and that actually the fact that I have this melanin or this hair is a very extremely superficial difference. We all realise, what was the purpose? What function does it have? Not just then, but now. What function does it have uh, in... You know, we have a European, Euro, American dominated uh, global system. What function does it have? Well, then it was slightly different if we go to the enslavement era. Then it actually allowed a justification of, uh, of why people could enslave, why they could do barbaric acts. So you have to remember that Christianity was a driving force for many people in those times. And so there was this fear that if people were engaged in these practices, they would not go to heaven, literally. So actually by arguing that people of these so-called different races didn't have souls, therefore they were property, it legitimized this process of, an Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nation was a really fundamental, groundbreaking, you know, like bookseller, if you want to use today's language. Um, that philosophy kind of like of race enabled people to feel comfortable in referring to people with these different colors, these different terms, because they're not quite human and it could be subjugated. The problem is now, to ask the second part of your question, how does it work now, is that we still live in the, the, the legacies of the, that, the, those, those atrocities. So I'm, I'm, I'm without going too deep into it, what happens is that there was a project and there was a concept called functionism. And this was the rage of all the time. It's kind of like a Sim City game where, you know, you might hear the term social engineering where you kind of put things in place, telling people what to do to work for the collective hive. And the main function of any human being is productivity. Marx touched upon this when, you know, in, in, in his theory, but, you know, there are other renditions that are equally as accurate. And this whole idea that human beings serve a particular national good, this collective good, um, and, and that anything that deviates from that actually must be squashed and the institutions must be, you know, kind of like, if they can't accommodate them, must eradicate those deviations. 
uh, anomalous, um, anomalies. That's kind of like how race still serves now. It, it serves to, for want of a better word, ghettoize or place into silos, communities that don't belong or are not perceived as belonging to the hegemonic structures, to, to, to the elite. It sounds like a conspiracy, but unfortunately, we know it's not. And, and that story, which I started with, just shows the function of it, isn't it? Doesn't it? Because the, the blue eyed, blonde haired Ukrainians, they can be admitted, people can be paid to have them in the home. They are seen as human beings who suffer. But the black people, even the black people who come actually from the Ukrainian situation, are treated in a totally different way. And that's what this allows, isn't it? Now, could you, could you just um, perhaps um, speak to, you know, um, and because this is a, a question that I'm asked sometimes, you know, when the revolution comes, everything will be different. So all we need to do is fight towards the revolution because actually everything is about class and not about race. What would your response be to that? That's, that's very problematic. Um, I'm a scholar activist, so it means that I have this kind of like inner dialogue in my head. One side is very nerdy and I like facts and, and, and evidence and data. And the other side is, oh my God, everything's just crazy. We just got to do something and act on impulse and act on emotion. And this is in the academy, rationality is, is king, right? And everyone else is irrational. And this is how that distinction runs. And so revolution has been rendered in this kind of like patronizing way where it just means violence. It just means the spontaneous uprising and everything changes. And that, it's not really kind of like a logical thought process. Revolution just does mean to change. It means a complete change, but the process itself is often, is often lifelong. We often don't actually get to see the end of the revolution. But because we live in a time now where we are really, uh, you know, our, our attention span is being fragmented all the time. So our attention span is being grabbed by Media buckets. I mean, right now I'm pretty sure too many, too many of us have spent loads of time watching and critiquing the, the the Oscars. Completely irrelevant. It's important. I mean, it's an interesting discussion. I've been engaged in it. But what happens? We divest our energy into these different discussions. We we can't work on a single project to make change. And class. And this is one thing that Marx did. Marx was a brilliant theorist, but Marx also was unfortunately he was afrophobic. He makes some extremely racist comments, which we don't talk about. And so what happens is that classism gives us a perfect explanation of why the world is the way it is. The problem is it's an accurate model. It's a great model. It's one of the best models we have, but it doesn't answer for the irrationality of racism. The nationality of racism, we know that there is no such thing as human races. This polygenesis theory is finished. We procreate. We can procreate by which other ethnic group we belong to. So we know we are a single race. And yet we still define people as black, as brown, as white, as yellow. So if I said a, a black European or a red Chinese man, or I mean, we know these things are nonsensical, but we still use them. So what's happening, for some reason as humans, we are still putting away a, a rational thought when it comes to change. And that, that, that process, that decision not to actually embrace the fact that to get the change that we want means actually engaging in multiple processes simultaneously, not just looking at a class struggle, but also looking at gender struggle. We still live under a patriarchal system. It's like we pretend it's not there, it's there. We still live under a, a capitalist structure. We recognize that, but you know, we have to deal with that. We still live under a strictly racist system. We have to deal with those things collectively, simultaneously. And if we place them in hierarchies, which is what many people often are convinced is the only solution, then what happens is that the other two just undermine it and we end up at square one. And, and, and I'll give you one example for that. When I started my PhD, it was in 2017. And I remember uh, the orange one in the White House had just been elected. And it's been a videotape of his misogynist comments towards women's genitalia, it was disgusting. He was still elected. We're talking about 25 million people knew he was a misogynist. There was a million, it was the 1st of January, I think the first week of January, a million women went around in a protest. I think they called it the, the Pussy Hat March, excuse the language, but they, they, they really had that name, the Pink yeah. Pussy Hat March. They went around marching this. People still elected him. He still went into the White House. You know, he still had fans. He, even when Biden came in, it was a close call. It wasn't a compelling win. 
it was a close call. So we know that people are aware of these prejudices. They're aware of these structural uh, anomalies that, are, that have been in place for hundreds of years, but they are not engaging with the facts that say we have to do with things like white supremacy. We have to do things like toxic masculinity. We have to do with the capitalist structure. We have to do with them all simultaneously, yeah. without favoring one over the other. And, and until we come to that realization, then what we're doing is what my research came out and I came up with a term called fadism. Now, now there was a, a German philosopher called Rudolf Jochen and he invented, or I shouldn't say invented, he was the first person to coin the term activism. This is like in the I think 13th, 14th century. And he defined activism in a different way to the way we conceptualize it now. He defined activism as something that was a lifelong process. In fact, he's quite blunt. He says that to do anything that would be an activist is actually to live a life of mediocrity. And so his argument was that actually we should be activists because we're trying to beautify the world. Now there was a, a Christian undertone to him, but when you conceptualize activism as a lifelong process, everything changes. See, right now we have this, what I call buffet style of activism, where one moment we're environmentalists, then we're feminists, and then we're anti-racist. And we just go around in a circle, picking whichever one tastes nice for the season. And it normally lasts around three to six months, and then we get bored and we move on to the next protest. When you take on a holistic approach of activism, which is a lifelong process, that means that you can be dealing with a particular issue for a whole year. You can be burnt out and then you can stop and you can recharge and you can recharge for six months. You can recharge for six weeks. It doesn't matter because you know you're coming back to it. You know you're going to work with other people who have the same mentality. You know that there's hope. You know that actually you're passing the baton on. So it might be your children or their children's children that's going to see this through. And this is completely different to the faddist approach that we are currently in right now, where everybody seems to conceptualize activism as wearing a t-shirt, going on a march. Solidarity building is very important. Let's be clear about that. Recognizing affirmation and actually raising the consciousness on issues is very important, but it doesn't bring about structural change, which is why I'm a scholar activist. I will do the marches, but I also do the boring nerdy work, which means data. It means research. It means evidence. It means finding out where the weaknesses are, targeting them systematically and dismantling them. And no one really, well, I shouldn't say no one, not enough of us really want to do that hard work. We do the emotional labor, but not the boring, nerdy, rational labor. So well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Toyin. I mean, I find it very interesting you, the way that you express that we have to actually do all sorts of things at the same time. And I, I really hope you'll come on again and talk to us because I can see there is a lot to learn from you. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'm much appreciated. Thank you. Tina. Jackie. I wonder now if now is the time to raise some criticism <laughs> that I might have. I think you caricatured uh, socialists there saying that, you know, the, don't worry about racism or women's discrimination, socialism will solve it. I, I don't think that's quite what, what socialists say. I think they, or, you know, I would say that uh, racism, women's discrimination can in the end, you know, these, these are divisions that have been created by capitalism, by class society for a reason to keep us separate. And, you know, as long as these structures exist, capitalism, etc., class society, we are unlikely to really overcome women's discrimination or racism. Doesn't mean we shouldn't fight it in the here. Absolutely, but Tina. I just wanted to say that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We're now going to talk to um, Jenny Mason, who is um, joining us from uh, Jewish Voice for Labour. Hi, welcome, Jenny. Hello. It's, it's, Man I, it's Manson, Tina, but not the. Sorry, oh, sorry. It's been anyway, a very long day. I, I wish I'd kept my maiden name Salomon because that was rather. Anyway, <laughs> much as I'm happy to be married to Mr. Manson. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jenny. Um, so we basically we we are talking about racism in in this in this session, and we thought it's extremely important that we discuss the issue of anti-Semitism as a form of racism. Racism. We'll get to it if actually Jews are a race or not. It's a, a whole big different discussion. But um, like myself, as from Labour Against the Witch Hunt, you also will have seen dozens and dozens of suspensions and expulsion letters with partially ridiculous accusations of of anti-semitism um we showed a clip last week actually where john lansman described somebody as anti-semitic who said i hate israel 
let's not go into that. But why do you think, in your view, what's what's behind uh, the, the fact that anti-Semitism has been so open to so many false accusations? What's the reason for that? Okay, well, there's um, several strands. Um, I just want to mention, because you're, you're the first to hear it, that my list of Jews involved in this um, allegation of anti-Semitism is now 50. It got to 50 yesterday. When it was about five, people thought that's extraordinary. Yeah, so we want to talk about the political background to this and also the question about what is anti-Semitism and it's morphing at various times. I mean, the I think maybe I want to talk first. Sorry, your question was, why has this happened? Why are there all these false claims of anti-Semitism? Um, one is to do with the particular nature of anti-Semitism, I think. It is, um, in some ways, it's easy to falsify it because we are not a race and we are not necessarily a religion. Uh, although the Equalities Act had to find some, some way to include Jews, so who like everyone else needs to be protected, we, as I say, they had to say that we were, could be protected either as a race or as a religion. But as many people know here, some, some hold a religion very dearly, but many of us don't. Um, because it isn't a race, then, and this is, it isn't a religion, what is anti-Semitism? I mean, I think, I don't know whether the rest of you feel this is a fair thing. I mean, racism to me is a hatred of another group. It's not really, a, I'm not equipped to discuss the whole issue about race as such. And I was very interested in the last speaker. All I can really talk about is the falsification recently of, of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has morphed over the years, for sure. So it's always there, as I think the Jews here will, will be able to say. It comes from some fear generated, and we hold the fear always in our minds that anti-Semitism will, will occur. But just to give you a couple of examples, my mother lived in Zhitomir, just outside Kiev. And in 1919, when she was a tiny little girl, they only just escaped a pogrom. And the reason for the pogrom at that time, the reason given was that they were all Bolsheviks, the Jews. Um, they were all communists. Um, we know about all the other features of anti-Semitism. As a little blonde English girl with rather a posh voice, no one ever knew I was Jewish. Um, and I didn't suffer much anti-Semitism, but when I was a tax inspector, I did actually do a history degree, but my history is, I'm not here as a historian in any way. Um, I discovered that in the minds of, of, of tax inspectors and others, Jews were rather scarily clever. That wasn't a compliment. They were devious. They were tricky. They were slightly dishonest. That was the kind of particular form. But what I'm going to say, it morphs at various times, and I don't want to I get Graham or someone to say, to give it some general, general knowledge, but what it never was about till the last um, five years, six years, it was never about anti-Israel or anti-Zionism in my experience. Uh, it's a complete new phenomenon. I don't know, again, people who know much more will tell me it's more than five or six years ago. And of course it's been manufactured. So just to give a couple of examples from my family again, within my parental homes, both my mother's family and my father's family, there were anti-Zionists and there were Zionists and there were people who were neither. And it would never have crossed anyone's mind to say that one or other of those groups was anti-Semitic. Anti I mean, they would say, oh, are you mad, Jenny? Are they mad? You know, that's what I hear my mother saying. Um, so sorry, so of course, that's only kind of why I think there's false allegations. I can come on to why it's been used, which is obviously a big question. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, it's, it's interesting you mentioned this is, you know, it's it's not been about criticism of Israel apart from the last six years. And that's definitely a change we've witnessed, isn't it? Sort of the definition of anti-Semitism has actually been changed, including by the Labour Party, unfortunately, by left wingers who seem to have mm. totally accepted that. You know, you say something critical about Israel and that may, means you're anti-Semitic. And it clearly, you know, if you look at dictionary, it's it means hostility or discrimination of Jews. And that is a huge political difference. Where do you situate that politically, geopolitically? Um, well, actually, it, it, I, I want to tell you on the other accusation against many of us, um, which is not about Islam. It, it fits rather well with my with my view. We all of us, I think, in JVL have to balance two political forces. One, the enormous need and interest 
of Israel and its supporters to be protected from criticism from outside and within. I talk to two Israelis regularly who are called anti-Semitic in Israel for calling it an occupation. Um, when I say what is happening to us. So there is the very strong and very, I'm afraid, very effective wish to, to de denigrate any critic of Israel as an anti-Sema, which has just happened to Yasmin al Brown, who um, yeah. um, But there is another factor which is nothing to do with Israel in my view, and that was the desperate uh, um, aggression or anger shown in huge parts of the Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn became a leader. Um, and I think that part, I mean, people vary in their views as to which is the stronger, and I'm sure that Tony and other Queen's and other people here will say, don't be a fool, Jenny, it's more about anti-Zionism, but it isn't only about anti-Zionism. There are some people I know in my area and within the Labour Party who don't have any particularly strong views about Israel, but have used this weapon against Corbyn and Corbynites. And the reason I wanted to mention it is there is another category of us who are getting accused of anti-Semitism, and that is those of us who question the Labour Party's campaign. Um, you probably know this line, we are undermining the party's ability to campaign against racism, to which David Rosenberg at the meeting, I said, what campaign against racism? But you know, which is a very good question. So the two are intertwined there. And I, I don't, I mean, people here can try and work out which is the most significant. I mean, I think my own view is that the most significant is the protection of Israel, um, but it hasn't half been used um, ruthlessly um, by, by an awful lot of people within the party. Some people um, think, and that's a kind of a positive way of looking at it, is that the need for this campaign arose because, you know, the BDS movement had become so strong. And in the aftermath of the 2014 bombing of Gaza, mm -hmm. that criticism of Israel had become so overwhelming and so huge. You know, the evidence was so overwhelming that this is a, a really a defensive campaign, you know, in the sense that Putin is doing a defensive war, you know, you, there is no need for it, but it, it explains it, um, why it's become quite such an, a, a, a campaign. Do you agree with that? that I, 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 I completely, I completely do. And actually, um, and Tony just pointed out, I can see that it, there was an earlier history. And actually, when Jews for Justice for Palestinians was set up, which was about 2000, was it, people? Um, that was also a criticism. So I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating to say it didn't appear. It didn't appear in my parents' childhoods, that's for sure. At least it might have it might sound among some people, but it was not a, a, a conversation. Uh, but it, of course, emerged particularly strongly when Jeremy became the leader. Yeah. And, and like, like me, you will have seen, I mean, there, you know, I have seen a few, very few cases where I thought, OK, yes, you could you could describe this as anti-Semitic you know, and education might be a better way to go about it than chucking them out. That's a different question. But, you know, these so anti-Semitism wasn't wasn't a huge problem. It was made out to be. But do you think this has led to, you know, a problem in terms of ignoring other forms of racism that then occurred? Yes. Well, what I, I mean, people, I, yeah, the reason I didn't want to use the expression of hierarchy of racism, what I don't want to do is compare forms of racism. What I can compare is public awareness of it. Um, and what this experience has been, and I think that's why it's, it's so seriously upset many of us and made us very angry. Um, because the because the, the, this anti-Semitism has received a huge amount of attention and at a false level, because the levels have been exaggerated, there has been a neglect of other forms of racism, no doubt about it, within the Labour Party, but actually much more widely. And that the downside of having huge numbers of false allegations is that on the one hand, there's a risk of real anti-Semitism being overshadowed, but more importantly in this group, because that's only one group, there's a, a, a a risk that, generally speaking, people think um, falsification is okay. I, I mentioned um, to somebody I haven't seen for ages yesterday how false the allegations are in the Labour Party. He was horrified to hear him saying back to me, oh, yes, and I, I imagine Islamophobia in the Tory party has been made up. I said, no, it has not been made up. You know, there's an idea if you have untruths around and injustice around, it's kind of catching. Um, uh, so. Um, 
yeah so is there a, is there a, is there a higher, there's definitely or definitely as far as i as we've all seen there's a hierarchy of how various forms of racism and hatred of other groups has been treated and like other people and but without my personal experience of course i'm horrified by the party's failure to deal the Labour party which i know about failure to deal with both islamophobia and other forms of racism um, and as far as we can tell from the Tory party as well. And in wider society, when you were talking earlier about um, what black people are facing, um, I continue to think we're a very racist society in Britain. And of course, I, I feel that this has taken us backwards, if anything, that the- um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just during this meeting, we've, I've just had notification that there has been a new round of prescriptions. You'll be pleased to hear that JVL is still not on the list. But the Labour Left Alliance has been banned now, Socialist Labour Network and the Alliance for Workers' Liberty. Why are they not coming for you, you think? For the well, day? you may have heard this rumour. The Jewish Chronicle said that a Labour official said that there could be a possible argument about discrimination if, a, if an organisation actually called it. And you probably know we're plugging on with the EHRC and we're actually getting a little bit of somewhere with them. Um, uh, because we are suggesting that there are forms of, um, um, uh, we, I can't exactly call it discrimination or, or anti-Semitism, but um, we are being picked up on particularly. But I think that's probably why JDL was, I mean, maybe we'll be prescribed tomorrow. I don't think we'll weep about it, but um, um, it's become a party that's uncomfortable to, to watch its, um, yeah. its conduct. And indeed, and uh, I, the last figures I've seen, I think it was half of your committee had been suspended. Or... All, all of all, no, we've all we've all experienced. I think eleven out of twelve of us have experienced accusations that the Labour Party has been investigated, with varying degrees of um, what's happened to us afterwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I, I'm I'm seriously for people who think I've heard all this before. I'm not making any special pleading, but there is something actually pretty unbearable as a Jew of being told that you're anti-Semitic. And um, one of the things I'm finding particularly unbearable, it hasn't happened to me actually, uh, but quite a lot of Jews who get suspended are being told that they have to um, receive training on anti-Semitism from the JLM. And I've asked our lawyers and others whether this makes some sort of human rights or something so humiliating and vicious somehow to tell most of us are old, old Jews, whose, whose parents only just escaped death in many cases, that we have to be told what anti-Semitism is by a... Um, you know, by the a, Jewish labour movement, right? An organisation that has no, no love for us. Um, no, and it's not a neutral body, is it, Jewish labour movement doing those kind of uh, sessions and training? Okay. Well, it, it shows that the Jewish uh, Jewish Voice for Labour has been a huge thorn in the side of, of the, uh, you know, the right um, that they're coming for you. So thank you very much for joining us and, and good luck with your with the rest thank of your you. campaign. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. Jackie. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I would say more than that, of course I would, because I'm no longer in the Labour Party. But, you know, as far as I can see, the way uh, that, it, that the Labour Party has allowed real Islamophobia to be spoken by many officials, really anti-Gypsy rhetoric to be, to be spoken without any, any comment at all. This, it seems to me clear that they want a particular kind of party and that party is not an anti-racist party. Anyway, I'm now going to be uh, talking to somebody called Adam Elliott Cooper, who has just written a book called British Policing and Black Resistance, which has, which has been very popular. And um, we're going to now show you an interview I did with Adam about violence against uh, black people and minorities. So in Britain, on average, one person a week um, dies at the hands of the police, prisons, uh, immigration or mental health institutions. Um, and we know that black people are disproportionately likely to uh, receive um, what's referred to as excessive force um, at the hands of these kinds of institutions. And so they're more likely to be on the receiving end of both a fatal violence, but also, of course, uh, crucially, violence more generally. 
But this is a pattern, of course, that we see throughout the, our criminal legal system. And we, see, we know that black people are disproportionately stopped, searched, arrested, charged and incarcerated. Um, and so thinking about policing more broadly, um, in addition to the kind of more acute, shocking and infuriating cases of uh, death and violence, is something the book really tries to uh, highlight. In, in a way that what happens with the police and the judiciary system are kind of the peaks of that. But actually, the level of violence towards black people, I'm talking about verbal violence and social violence, is, is, is really quite massive. What would you say? Where does it come from? What's the source of this? So I don't think there's any one single source, of course, of race. But what the book does try to do is think about some of the histories of British colonialism that can help us to better uh, situate historically um, the racism that we're confronted with in the 21st century. People who are colonized required coercion, control, exploitation, um, and other forms of uh, hierarchical management, I guess. And so some of the examples I think about are the labor movement in Trinidad in the 1930s, where people went on strike and protested and challenged British colonial rule and were, um, and in response, Britain sent in uh, naval vessels to repress these uh, labour uprisings. I think about the anti-colonial movement in places like Kenya and Malaya, where Britain said engaged in forms of more militarised policing, uh, what, which, what they refer to as counterinsurgency policing. But crucially as well, I think about how these forms of colonial policing came home, so to speak. We see um, uh, pepper spray and CS um, spray being used for the first time on the British mainland. Before that, it only ever been used in Northern Ireland and, and, and other uh, British colonies. Um, and then we also see other colonial tactics, such as driving armoured vehicles into large crowds of people in, in a purported attempt to disperse them. After 1981, we really see this ramped up with the, with the uh, appointment of Sir Kenneth Newman as head of the Metropolitan Police, who cuts his teeth as a British police officer in British Mandate Palestine and then in the north of Ireland. And it's from his experience of colonial policing in these two contexts that he is considered to be an appropriate person to deal with the black inner city areas of places like London. And it's he, it's he who introduces for the first time in the British mainland the use of baton rounds, rubber bullets, which he um, brings to the scene of the urban uprisings of Broadwater Farm in Tottenham in North London in 1985. So again, you see in very material ways, both the tactics and policies, but also the actual colonial police officers themselves coming from the colonial context and being brought in to the centre of empire. I think it's really interesting to think the way this all feeds into the material and the social betterment, if you like, of what some of us were taught to count as the home country. Thinking about it in this material way, I think is so crucial for maybe two or three key reasons. Part of it is because the development of British policing, which for most of Britain's history has taken place not, in, not on the British mainland, but of course in its colonies, often is a way of facilitating exploitation of labor, exploitation of workers, controlling enslaved populations, indentured populations, um, populations which are being ethnically cleansed, such in, in places like Kenya or South Africa or Rhodesia or Australia. All of these different exploited groups of people require a form of policing in one way or another. But what's also really important is, of course, these people who are being exploited materially often resist Right? right, consistently resist. And that, of course, then again, requires further policing on the part of the British Empire. And so when we think about that in the, in the tw late 20th and early 21st century, we see similar things, right? We see the rise of a more, a very explicitly um, uh, racist kinds of policing in the 1970s during the period of economic recession. We see a generation of black youth in particular unable to access the kind of employment opportunities their parents were. And then two things happen, right, crucially. One of the things that happens is, of course, they're more likely to be engaged in criminalized forms of income generation, whether that be maybe uh, selling drugs or uh, gambling or other forms of um, uh, unlicensed or criminalized activity. But the other thing that's really crucial is that, of course, and Stuart Hall um, has written about this, Jamaican academic has written about this, during the economic crisis of the 1970s, the government isn't able or willing to deal with that economic crisis, isn't able to deal with that crisis of capitalism. 
So it starts to lose legitimacy in the eyes of the public. So what they do is they say that there is a different crisis that they are going to deal with. And that crisis for them is a crisis of criminality. It is a crisis of violence. It is a racial crisis. And so rather than dealing with the contradictions of capitalism, the crises of capitalism, they instead deal with this other purported crisis. Again, we see this fundamental link between racism and capitalism, what I think might be useful for people to think about as a racial capitalism rather than simply racism or capitalism alone. And once these things are implemented, they are deployed on anyone um, that the police or the state considers to be deviant or criminal. Uh, what would you say is the interrelationship? Because this is quite an argument, um, not just generally, but on the left as well, uh, between race and class. I mean, we've seen in the most recent report uh, by the government on race, that they're basically saying, you know, we, we, we haven't really got race anymore. Race isn't a problem. It all comes down to class and poverty, but there are echoes of that in left-wing thought as well. A lot of dominance or mainstream left-wing thoughts the idea is that as capitalism expands and people become um, uh, exploited by capitalism, they become more similar. They work at similar kinds of jobs. They work at similar kinds of, they're exploited in more, uh, in similar kinds of ways. But I think one of the things that capitalism actually does is, isn't that at all. It actually differentiates between different kinds of workers, right? And it exploits them differently, right? So, so, uh, so workers in one sector of an economy in maybe, I don't know, South Asia or Southern Africa might be exploited differently to workers who live, who live in work in um, Western Europe or North America or New Zealand, for instance. And one of the key ways in which these workers are exploited differently is through racial divisions, right? We can think about national divisions and ethnic divisions, but race is one of the key ways in which this is done. So we can think about this historically, where if we take the Caribbean, for instance, we have some workers who are enslaved through chattel slavery, um, and they're racialized as black, or at those days racialized as Negro. You would have um, people who are indentured, who would be racialized as so-called coolie labor, or or South Asian, and you'd have people who are exploited through wage labor, who'd be racialized as white or perhaps Irish, right? So you have these differently exploited workers in this, in this same Caribbean context, and the way in which they are exploited differently through this expansion of colonial capitalism is through race. So if we think about how race plays this really fundamental role in enabling capitalism to exploit different groups of people in different ways, in order to not simply divide workers and break down links of solidarity, but also, of course, be, um, enable them to maximise their profits by being, by being far more nimble in different economic and social contexts, we can see that actually race um, capitalism has never really functioned without racism, right? And we don't really know of a capitalism which is not racial. And that's why, again, I think it's crucial to us, for us to understand capitalism, not simply as capitalism, but as racial capitalism. Certain um, jobs in this country are filled more by ethnic minorities than others. And so that you see, for example, in the NHS, we have a very kind of almost Auntie Jemima attitude where we say, aren't these nurses wonderful? Uh, but we all we have to do is clap them. We don't really have to pay them. I think that the global pandemic has really brought into sharp relief many of the dynamics of Britain's racial capitalist landscape. The fact that uh, racialized minorities were more likely to contract um, um, uh, COVID-19 in the early months and years of the pandemic in particular spoke to a number of issues in British society related to housing or access to healthcare and what have you. But one of the key ones, of course, was in relation to work and capitalism. And the fact that far more people um, who are maybe black or Asian are likely to do jobs which um, they couldn't work from home, uh, they were public facing, uh, they were more likely to work in um, uh, as taxi drivers or in catering um, or in uh, the public sector, the um, working in public health, and what have you, all of these types of um, work were not protected uh, during the pandemic. They weren't receiving the kinds of support. They were being super hyper exploited within this particular context. And what this led to was effectively suffering and for many people, premature death. And so again, we see how these forms of racial capitalism in Britain don't simply lead to people being exploited in different ways, but can actually lead to people um, dying um, prematurely as well. Okay, so uh, what's the future? Uh, do you propose 
uh, any 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 way forward. This is a kind of campaign which in the US is called defunding the police, mm -hmm. where funds and resources and power and reliance on the police and prison system is eroded in favour of building community led forms of infrastructure. But it's also part of a more revolutionary radical vision of a world in which we want to see a world in which prisons and police are no longer institutions that are required in order to govern society. They are not institutions of coercion, which we rely on in order to um, provide people with safety and harm reduction. Thank you so much. For me, what was really good about that in interview, I had been confused for quite some time really about why I should be advocating for defunding the police. And he gave such a convincing argument for that and if you look at what's happening to the funding of uh, the judiciary and the uh, the whole prison service and who is being imprisoned and why I mean it, it's terrifying we are really taking an American model um, I'm just going to remind everybody now we're doing very well with our Patreons but it would be great if any of you could actually support, as you know, we don't charge for these programs at all, but if you feel you could spare some money, please go on, the links are in the chat so that you could support our work. And I'm going to chat now to Delia Mattis. Now, G Delia, I mean, in, in a way, I want to speak to you about two things. One is, of course, you're now, you're here, um, and involved with Black Lives Matter, but you also used to be, or perhaps still are, I'm not quite sure, a member of the Labour Party. But shall we start with, with the police and Black Lives Matter? What are your thoughts on defunding the police? It's interesting because um, some people have got different views on this policy, and I absolutely am 100% behind it. And recently with the incident with Child Q, um, <clears throat> a lot more people have said, I was a bit worried about this policy that you guys were advocating. And now listening to you, we're hundred percent behind you. Um, so last week we had a uh, Hackney police, uh, the borough commander held a, a public meeting and um, it was so shameful and disgraceful. The two people, the, two, the police officers that strip searched the child have been given some cushy backroom job. They're not even being punished. Um, the borough commander has been asked to resign by a number of bodies, including the council, and he's resisting um, resigning. They actually came to the meeting and played victim in the end. They talked about how difficult it's been for them. Um, there was no... Um, plan to discipline anybody. Uh, they just made excuses for their disgraceful behaviour, what they did to a, a child in school. And there were people in that meeting who talked about training and it's ever so irritating to me when people talk about police training, what can we do? Can we train the police to be, you know, more anti-racist? What can we do about that? Well, there is no training because White supremacy is rooted in the police force. It was built on that premise and it has always been that way. I mean, I don't know if some of you will remember, um, I think it was 1999, the McPherson report. And that was a big to do. Everybody was waiting for the outcome of this report. And then it said clearly that there's institutional racism in the police. And what has happened since then? Nothing. Some would argue that it's got even worse. Um, nothing has happened. The talks about reforms and let's reform the police, I mean, evidence has shown us that it cannot be reformed. How do you reform a white supremacist organisation? If somebody could tell me that, I'm all ears. Um, it can't be reformed. And so in the interest of equality and fairness to people who have been evidently brutalised by the police for many, many years, um, why should we continue to support funding a force that subjects us to such violence and brutality? And instead, why don't we try funding communities? Let's get the kids off the street. Let's give them new sentence. Let's give them opportunities to get themselves into work or further training. 
Um, let's stop this child to school to prison pipeline where black children are disproportionately excluded from inner city schools and they end up going to prison. You know, why don't we change this? I mean, Einstein's definition of insanity is to repeat the same thing over and over again and expect different yeah. results. Yeah. So we're going to continue to fund the police and not fund communities and expect something different to happen, yeah. it's not going to. And I'll go further. I, I would say that the police force is such a failure. Um, you look at the racist policies, the stop and search, which has a, a success rate of under 15%. What organization would operate with such a low success rate? You know, I'd go further and say, I think the police force in its current form has to be abolished. I, I think the kind of organization that would function with that kind of success rate is an organization whose purpose is not to actually prevent crime. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what Adam was saying, that we've got to start understanding that the purpose of the police is, is another thing. It's another thing about control. And while we're talking about that, um, it feels to me like a lot of the um, new legislation that's coming in uh, to ban protests, for example, and keep people off the streets, stop people making noise, is a result of the actions and the very effective actions of Black Lives Matters. I think it scared them to death. What do you think? Absolutely. It's a direct response to the BLM uprising in 2020. And unlucky for them, um, people are talking about actual racism now more than I've ever seen, actually. There's been more programs on it. There's more representation on television of black people. The people kids are talking about it in schools. Our young people are firmly behind the Black Lives Matter movement. I've spoken in a number of schools. And the kids are amazing. They, they get it. Yeah. And it scares the shit, excuse my language, out of the state. Yes. And they needed to do something about it, something yes. so drastic as yes. to try and stop protesting. Thank you very much, Delia. Um, and just one kind of last quick one, really, before we move on. I quite love the comment that you made about training. I used to actually, one of the jobs I used to do was train the police, believe it or not, uh, in Dorset. And I think one thing that struck me is that you might raise awareness with some individual police, but when you're talking about structural racism, that's really what you can't move. And, and actually, we also see training used in a quite cynical way. For example, do you remember Starmer went and did a half a day training against being an anti-Black racist? I mean, you know, that's it, isn't it? And that's that is the kind of anti-racism that we don't need. It's the same thing as it's just always having to say, I don't believe that every police officer is racist. And, and I'd be a fool if I thought every police officer was racist. And there's going to be a few police officers that, you know, will engage with you and want to learn about racism. But the system itself, the whole structure of it, if you've got senior police officers saying, look, as far as we're concerned, Black people are more aggressive, even though there's no evidence to back that up. Actually, the opposite is well evidenced. If you have senior, very senior police officers that come at it from that premise, it, it can't be changed. And there's also the fact that, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a bad cold. Um, racist people will join the police force because they know it gives them power to do what they would like to do in the streets with Black people. Uh, and that's just a fact. So, yeah, there's no training available that can solve that issue. Yeah, we need actual structural change. Thank you, Delia. We hope to speak to you again at some point, Red Lion TV. Thank you. Thank you. And over to you, Tina. Hi. Yes, actually, over to me and Suresh Grover. Hold on. Um, who has been, there you go. Hello, Suresh. Um, Suresh, you've been an, uh, you know, and I think most people know about you. You've been a, a very active anti-racism campaigner for over 40 years. 
Um, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the race report by the government, which you have commented about uh, previously. But first of all, I was wondering if you could tell us in those 40 years, what's, you know, if you compare to when you, from when you started to now, what's the biggest positive change you've seen? And perhaps what's the biggest negative change? And, you know, are things getting better generally or is it just different, bad? Um, it's very difficult to measure because in the 1970s, when I was stabbed by skinheads, which brought me to work on anti-racism, there was a vision of the world willing to change and a world which could be changed because of activism and alliance with different groups on a global scale. We live in a very different world, so it has an impact on what you do locally. Um, in terms of uh, racism, I mean, I think if you're a serious activist, you know that you're not going to get rid of racism in the system, which is so tied in and ingrained in the system, and other speakers have spoken about it. What you end up doing is trying to expose it, um, scratch at the service, show its uh, violent form, show its oppressive nature, bring it to the public attention. So there's been very strong victories of uh, exposing the state for its racism um, on many occasions and things have moved forward and then backwards uh, because of changing priorities because racism itself changes its form depending on the market and depending on capitalism and where it's moving so the industrial racism that existed during the advent of imperialism isn't the racism that we experience in neoliberalism it's very different but it is as brutal as it was um, I think more people are willing to engage in, in defining what anti-racism is, not just looking at what racism is, which is a big, big issue. Uh, so when we, when we discuss racism, most of us forget how we define anti-racism. Amongst the left, they would define anti-fascism, but they have problems in defining anti-racism or actually linking those two together. Um, and the other thing is that there's a concerted effort now which didn't exist before, probably because of state's narrative on racism, trying to divorce class from racism very consciously and make racism in the mainstream to be viewed as an individual experience of hate, totally divorced from the economic and political context. And that process really starts post Lawrence as a reaction to the finding of the Lawrence report that there is institutional racism within the police force. As you know, the debate around it has been a very long one. Scarman rejects it. The American experience and the Black Panthers, Stokely, Michael, et al. look at what notions of institutionalized racism exist, not just in the state police issues, but also within the health service and employment, et cetera. So I think, um, in the 70s, um, I used to be called a packy on the street, and my generation, I'm 60 odd now, I think 40-50% suffered direct forms of police or race br brutality. I think that has changed, that doesn't exist. But there is the growth of hate crime um, coming back post-Brexit. Uh, so I work in the monitoring group in in the metropolitan capital, there are something like 28,000 race attacks registered or recorded by the police. So there's, it's, the problem hasn't died, contrary to what people said. It takes a very different form, and it, depending on where you are, um, I think it, the fault lines have become much more sharper. Uh, the violence isn't divorced from the violence in society. Let me just tell you that because... You know, there is in, in our system, there's an acceptance by the state of violence existing in working class communities because they're seen, seen as people or individuals who are divorced from high culture. That's how they are seen. So when you go to, when you go to working class areas where large sections of black people and brown people and migrants live, and so they're not divorced from the working class at all, 
there's this acceptance that a level of violence will exist against women, against each other, by the police, and that permeates the notions of racial violence. It's not just between white and black, that nature of violence is accepted by society, just like a level of unemployment is accepted in capitalist society. Yeah. But that has a massive consequence in, when you look at um, the impact of racism on people of color, or especially people of color who are poor. I'm using these terms because there's no generic understanding of what we should call ourselves at this moment. And the Sewell Report tries to divorce the black minority experience from general minorities in, in the UK. And, um, you, know, if it's, you know, it's not surprising to us that Sewell Report was going to be what it was. In fact, the monitoring group issued a legal process and action against Boris Johnson when he, when he announced it. We said to him that Tony Sewell couldn't be the chair because of his beliefs about young black people, about working class, about um, black communities, as well as people who are, have a different sexual orientation. And we were, and he, I mean, Johnson himself and the treasury listers threw the sink, sink at us and saying, even if you win the JR, he will still be the chair and the report will say what it does, et cetera. Not surprising because um, if you don't look at the economic and the political context, you will always uh, have politicians expressing amazement at the existence of racism. For example, you know, the Lawrence report, is it a, is it a, it, it wasn't a surprise there was institutional racism, you know, institutional racism, we had to define it. But you had somebody like Jack Straw, who's the Home Secretary, say, I'm shocked that there is institutional racism. The shock is that he was shocked, actually. So you have to put it in that context because politicians have always hidden both the breadth, the context, and the impact of it, and also divorced it from class repeatedly. And that's the process that's taking place at the moment. So you divorce it, make it very individualized. Um, you create an ideological framework which separate, separates it from class and you then make the working class, white working class totally separate. And then you divorce it from its historical roots from okay. colonialism and imperialism. So therefore you think Israel and Palestine is not an issue of racism or apartheid. And then the IHRA definition becomes a soulless, a historical document, which is meant for research and becomes policy. So that's what the process is. That, that's actually the process at the moment. So at the moment, the contest politically is how we define anti-racism and state is trying to define it for us. Yes, I, I want to come back to that with, with you, um, you know, how, how you say in the left doesn't know how to define anti-racism. But first, um, on, the, on that report, I mean, the, the, when it was presented, it was presented actually as um, pretending to be about, oh, we understand about class. This, that, that's how they, they were pushing it, wasn't it? And then you read it and actually it doesn't at all. It makes it, it, it puts the, the blame on cultures. You know, there's some cultures that are just not as civilized as, as, as ours or as others, you know, the Chinese. It also, it's like, like the Chinese are much better at integrating than, you know, other, other cultures, etc. So they're really terrible parts in that. In that report, it also says it wants to increase the legitimacy and accountability of stop and search rather than you know just stopping it and understand. So you know you have video cameras and so to make you feel better when you're being you know stop and searched, which is unlikely to work. What I did think was interesting in the report, and I wonder what you think about it, is to scrap the the term BAME, B A M E, um, and that is actually something I've heard from quite a few people that you know would have been described as as BAME because it lumps together people with very different experiences. Do you think, I mean, there's there's two tendencies, isn't it? There? There's a sort of, you know, black people, people of color, you know, they, they have similar experiences and they should fight together. But if you, or, or do you say BAME actually puts too many people together and they, they should be separated out more and should be, you know, fighting for their own particular section, do you know? How, how do you see that that dynamic? A separate policy from politics. BAME is a very pol uh, policy 
defined term, but unfortunately it gets used on a, on a daily basis by mass media and describing individuals. I never describe myself, neither would Adam, neither would other speakers as BAME. I'm pretty citizen of Asian origin or I have black politics, et cetera, et cetera, with very pluralistic identities. So you're not gonna have a policy word which describes it holistically for us. BAME became important because before BAME, and, and BAME was used by the Lawrence uh, um, inquiry for the first time, before that it was ethnic minorities rather than black um, you know, and ethnic minorities because it tried to show and tried to include black communities in the disproportionality in terms of research and statistical data that existed. Not a, a word that is uh, absolutely um, without you know, criticism, but it's, it's a policy term, it's not a political term. So what, what Searle and other people do is they know that it's unpopular. And so they take the black out and just use ethnic minorities. So, you have a diversified cultural definition of data being developed and researched because you want to take race out of it and only look at issues to do with culture, et cetera. So that's the context of why BAME is being criticized by so not for the right reason, but to try and uh, invisibilize the experience of black minorities, et cetera. Um, I, I think there is, uh, and it's not because of Sewell, I think there is, a, uh, there is absolutely necessary to look at how poorer sections of black communities suffer disproportionately. There's no question about it. And then there is, a, um, I think if you look at, you know, for example, um, uh, the disproportionality during the health crisis and the pandemic, um, the NH obviously, the government post obviously failed in its uh, response to the pandemic. But so did the NHS because all it offered in terms of explanation was that uh, in terms of explaining disproportionality was comorbidities, which is existence of two ailments so people become more vulnerable or genetical, which was racialized data using racialized data. It totally ignored the structural problems that existed within the NHS of it employing something like 3 million young, poorer sections of people who used its services and actually didn't uh, examine or deal with or responded to the uh, disproportionalities that existed within the health service before its race equality frameworks, which warned, for example, the lack of access of black or Asian people using NHS, especially with the poor, more vulnerable migrant workers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think. I think you need to examine that, but you don't do it from the lens that Sewell does it. You do it from the lens that you want to make sure that the poorer sections in our community, because of the way the system works, actually have access to services which are of quality nature. That's what you want to do, and that's the reason for that research. Mm. We talked about last week, in last week's show, we talked about the culture wars, and I think this report by the government is certainly part of the culture war against the left. It was it was written in, in response to BLM protests, and the government tried to show that they understand about, you know, racism. It's not all that bad anymore, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we looked at how in schools as well, there is an effort to, you know, change change how history is being taught because there has been so much uh, pushback from people from teachers who say actually you know maybe we shouldn't just teach you know the colonial past as if there was no problem with it and we should be more critical etc cetera, etc cetera. and we've had uh, recently equalities minister kemi badenock saying she's absolutely terrified about children learning about critical race theory in schools can you explain to us what critical race theory is and why she's afraid of it? I mean, uh, in terms of the government response to BLM and to the debate that's taking place, uh, there is critical race theory looks at uh, racism from a historical colonial perspective, which looks at racism, which is not simply divorced or just contemporary arising out of thin air, but actually looks at the development of it, how things have uh, been uh, examined, 
how it's how black lives or you know minority lives and BME communities have brought into this country experience and then what uh, different lenses have come about to examine the notion of race for example if you look at uh, the history of thought and activism in terms of anti-racism over the last hundred years you 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 look at slavery and you don't you just don't look at the issue of slavery being um, abolished because of the efforts of Wilberforce, but you look at the uh, historical anti-slave movements and how slaves uh, in Dominica and Haiti, not only they abolished slavery and fought against it, but also had an impact on the French Revolution who then um, uh, uh, in, the, in the French Civil War and the French Revolutions. Or you look at, for example, the growth of uh, um, national struggles against colonialism and the independence struggles and how, um, you know, the debate between M. and Roy and, for example, Lenin, which is very critical because it, prior to that, the Bolsheviks are looking at um, uh, the development uh, of revolution in an industrialized country, not in the East. And uh, you have people like Bernstein. Uh, Bernstein, I think it is the head of the Social Democrat movement in, in, in Germany in 1928, who actually talks about um, colonialism through a socialist angle rather than the abolition of uh, colonialism. And then you have the debate in Hanuman Roy, which is a development of anti-racist thought taking place, uh, which begins to look at the power of colonial struggles moving to more progressive struggle because of colonialism. And for the first time, you have socialists in the Bolshevik party examining the link between colonialism and, and revolution, which is a progressive a definition of self-determination and, and nationalism. So critical race theory looks at all those factors, including the notion of how state racism has been developed, et cetera, rather than you know, just on a very genetic face value. Obviously, the government is it's 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 going to be opposed to it because uh, it it you, by looking at critical race theory, you are actually looking at the current state of state race relations in the UK and the and the role that the government plays in enforcing state racism directly, not just in the curriculum but on on a daily basis, from immigration laws to policing, etc. And um, I mean, it's it's. It's worse than that. It's not just the narrative. It's where we are living in a period where anti-racism is being criminalized. Uh, um, issues to do with challenging environment coming into protest is being criminalized. And uh, so marching, the impact of how, how, you, how you organize marches, the powers you have in what you say, um, how loud you can be, oh. whose permission you need. We, we know we don't have a constitution, but even those discretionary powers that the police are, are being uh, decreased. So um, it's just not a reaction to the BLM, but I think it's also a reaction to the environmental movement on a global basis. And the two threats uh, are, are, are really, really, really threats that the government is looking at. And, Changing its leg the legislation or its the, the methods used by extinction rebellion and the power and the vocal and the social media used by the BLM uh, on a global basis. Yeah, it, it certainly shows a, a certain fra fragility of the system that they feel they have to um, release all these new laws, which are really, as you say, undermining our, our right to protest. Also, I thought the the recent news, I mean, today's news about. Prince William saying he might not lead the Commonwealth um, because there's been such pushback and blowback from, you know, the way they've been posing and going around and thought they would still be celebrated everywhere, etc. It shows a, a certain fragility of, of this kind of thinking, which is being, you know, undermined by people using their their own heads and, and starting to question things. So my, my last point is really something that that you mentioned right at the beginning. And I think that's that's quite important self criticism, you know, of the left. Um, and you, you said we, we are having problems, the left has problem defining um, anti racism, that would interest me. And also then 
perhaps as a as a as a last thought, what do you think about how we should organize? I mean, at, you know, I'm a Marxist. I think we should organize as a class. You know, we should all be together in the same organization. And you know, I'm I'm not a not a fan of women's organizations or black sections or black you know black only lists or women only lists, etc. So I'd rather think we should we should get together. Is that am I saying that because I'm you know white? <laughs> Or is that, you know, yeah. where, where do you stand with, with, with that kind of other lecture? I don't think it's clear where I stand. I think I would consider myself as a Marxist, but I define, I, Marx is somebody who really analyzed capitalism. There is no a definition of socialism in him or a post-capitalist society. For me, a classless society, which is the end process, right, is where there's a diminishing um, uh, value or a diminishing state where racism, patriarchy is challenged. Socialism is a, I don't see it as a structural or, a, or an evolutionary process. I see it as a process where you are getting rid of the power of capital and where working people who I don't see purely as, as, as white men personally, I think the working class is the only force, social force or an economic class where you have women, you have black people, you have uh, transgender, you have other social forces, and it has the power if it becomes a class in it, not in itself, but for itself, and that's really important. Um, and it can begin when it becomes a class for itself to look at those social issues rather than just on an economic basis. So I think that process of challenging capitalism, which has a, it, it's, where capital is where capital is dominant, but where uh, the role of the working class, because it's being exploited and it is being, uh, it has that. If it becomes a class of result, it actually becomes a, a class of conscious. It will have to confront, and it is actually confronting the different layers of stratification with it and and of discrimination with it. I mean, patriarchy is not something that's alien to Engels, for example. It is in his thesis on you know private property and family etc cetera, etc cetera. um i don't see it as i don't i i believe in self determination self organization of women or black people of transgender but i see that as part of a, a, a conscious group of people who are beginning to challenge capitalism because what it represents i don't see it as separate i think if you strengthen self organization of women you strengthen anti capitalism okay obviously there are different variants of it and so for some people, patriarchy is more important than class. I don't think, I think you, I think if you look at the anti-racist movement in Britain, there were two kinds of movements that existed. One was politics of representation. And I, you know, I'm somebody who said when black MPs who are actually friends of mine, by the way, people, the first four, especially were friends of mine, Keith was, Paul Boat and Diane Abbott um, and Bernie Grant. I, I, I think maybe one of them succeeded. I think the three were mistakes. <laughs> and I think that we can't keep on making those mistakes. So the politics of representation without community or class struggle actually is meaningless. You have to combine those two. If you don't combine those two, you end up empowering a very black middle class. And I think there is the politics of discrimination and politics of murder and racism can discriminate and lead to death. And I think if you want to make a priority, and I have made it into a priority, I think working class black people, and I use that word in too direct, which includes women as well, are a priority. So representation is really important, but it's not the end game. The bigger price is a larger section of group who actually are able to contribute to a discussion and a narrative which changes society. And it depends on the politics of that self-representation, doesn't it? I mean, Margaret Thatcher was a woman. <laughs> She's not absolutely, doing absolutely. any favors for the fight women, fight for women's rights. Thank you so much, Suresh, for, for joining us. That that was a bit longer than we had planned, but I thought it was really interesting. So thank you. Thank you for, for, for joining us uh, tonight. Thank um, you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Jackie. Sorry, I muted you earlier because you were making a noise. <laughs> so you need to unmute yourself. 
So what do we think of self uh, of uh, black sections then? What do we think of all black uh, selection lists? Graham, can you unmute yourself? I thought Suresh said it really well. It depends, doesn't it? It depends on the politics of that. Those self-organization can be very bad and can be very good. So were you asking me, Jackie? Yeah? Yeah. Well, first, yes. firstly, let me just say that how wonderful to see Suresh again. I haven't seen him for a number of years. As brilliant as ever. I agree with Suresh. Um, briefing, Redline TV, Briefing TV, Briefing Magazine uh, is a successor to Briefing Magazine. And for 40 years, Briefing Magazine was in the forefront of the struggle for black and women's self-representation. In particular, in the 1980s, we supported black sections. It's interesting what um, uh, Sore said. He says of the four original MPs, one succeeded. I'm not sure which one he meant, whether it was Diane Abbott or Bernie Grant, because I think to some extent both succeeded, whereas I can't, you can't say that at all about the um, uh, other two. So I think it was important as part of a whole, and I think it's really good the way that uh, Suresh connected race and class. Uh, black people, women, especially oppressed groups within the working class, and for a period of time, it's important to have that separate black self-representation in order to be a stronger part of the whole. And I think it was a point really, really well made by Suresh, and I'm certainly on your side on that. Can I just say one other thing while I'm here, just going back to another debate, um, when Jenny Manson talked about the reason uh, for the anti-Semitism, which I'm, of course I've been expelled after 53 years, I'm a Jewish socialist. This is, in a, if we want to simplify it, and it is multifaceted, but it really is class war, the establishment waging war on the left. And that's what that was really about. But anyway, it's been a great debate, uh, really important discussions. And once again, so good to see Suresh again. Great. Um, thank you, Tina. I think that was a very useful debate. We're now coming towards the end of uh, the programme. but we've, And before we finish, we've got a couple of more things. Uh, one is putting a different spin on the programme totally. We're having a... a, a a kind of musical moment and a political moment all in one with Teo. Are you now a member of the Communist Party? Oh, please, please, please. Please answer, will you, Mr. Robeson? What is the Communist Party? What do you mean by that? Are you now a member of the Communist Party? Would you like Party? to come to the ballot box when I vote and take out the ballot and see? Mr. Chairman, I respectfully suggest the witness be directed to answer the question. In the first place, Wherever I have been in the world, the first to die in the struggle against fascism were the communists. I laid many wreaths upon the graves of communists. That is not criminal. I ask you to affirm or deny the fact that your communist party name was I John Thomas. The Fifth Amendment. This is really ridiculous. The witness talks very loud when he makes a speech, but when he invokes the Fifth Amendment, I can't hear him. I have medals for diction. Right. I can talk plenty loud. Will you talk a little louder? I invoke the Fifth Amendment loudly. John Thomas, my name is Paul Robeson, and anything I have to say, I have said in public all over the world, and that is why I'm here today. Sir, who are Mr. and Mrs. Vladimir I Nikia? invoke the Fifth Amendment. Do you know a Manning Johnson? I invoke the Fifth Amendment. Do you know Gregory Kaifitz? I invoke the Fifth Amendment. Do you know a Max Jurgen? I invoke the Fifth Amendment. I'm not being tried for whether I'm a communist. I'm being tried for fighting for the rights of my people, who are still second-class citizens in this country, in this United States of America. You are responsible, you and your forebears, for 60 to 100 million black people dying in the slave ships and on the plantations. Don't you ask me about anybody. Paul Robeson, very exciting and pleasing to finish with somebody who is whose story is so complex and uplifting and informative and uh, of course in the end there is some tragedy to the way he finishes life but can you tell us something about why he has interested you so much 
Yes, um, I first came across him because somebody heard me singing a song and she said I reminded him her of him and I had never heard of him. This was back in 1995. And then I stumbled on his biography and felt after reading it that in this one man's life, there is so much to learn about African history from pre-slavery days through slavery and emancipation and liberation struggles to continuing struggles for dignity and equality, not just for African peoples, but for people all over the world. And it was encapsulated in this one individual who had been successfully uh, erased from history to the extent that I, a relatively well-educated black man, knew nothing about him. And so I determined that this was a story that had to be shared. And I've been doing that for 15 years now, roughly. And even to this day, I maintain that if people take away their prejudices and study this one man's life and the things he stood for and tried to convince other people to embrace, the world would be an infinitely better place. Yeah, indeed. And I think what's really important as well about Paul Robeson, although he was obviously on the left, is that actually his blackness, his negritude, uh, whatever you want to call it, was of critical importance to how he saw the world, wasn't it? His father had been born in slavery in Martin County in North Carolina in the early mid uh, 19th century and escaped. So this was the son of a slave. But that person who had escaped slavery at the age of 15 somehow learned about African history and taught it to his five children. So this former slave taught history and dignity to his five children, so much so that I felt that I was learning most of what I knew about African history from this son of a former slave. And that was the basis of you know, his life's philosophy, that I am an African, I walk the earth as an African, but I will pull everybody along with me as long as they treat me with decency and respect. That's great, Teo, thank you. And what song are you going to give us? Um, well, Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, because <laughs> for me it encapsulates Paul's philosophy. You don't... Uh, you don't spend your time lamenting your situation, you fight. You take your inspiration from fighters like Joshua. Lovely. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come a tumbling down. You may talk about your king of Gideon, you may talk about your man of Saul. There's none like a good old Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Up to the walls of Jericho, he marched with sword in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the battle am in my hand. Then the lamb ram sheep horns begin to blow, the trumpets begin to sound. Joshua commanded the children to shout, and the walls come a tumbling down that the morning Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, 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 Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come a tumbling down. Thank you, and that's what Red Lines is about. We want to see those walls come tumbling down. Thank you very much, Teo. Isn't that just so uplifting? I mean, I always, I can't, I can't stop singing along to it, partly as well, because I remember my mother singing it as well. Now, we're not going to be with you next week. Um, I don't know if some of you remember, the programmes that we were starting with were always pilot shows, and we're giving ourselves a week off to have a think and look at what we've been doing and how we've been doing. But we will be back on the 11th of April, so please 
come and see us again, share us, come and support us. And we're going out now, we're going out with something again very special, which is a list of all the black people who have been killed in police custody. Thank you and good night and see you on the 11th. Bye.